Uh, great, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, my name is Ken Draknik. I am, uh, as he said, the Director of Product Marketing. And what we're gonna do today is talk a little bit about how you interpret a lot of the numbers you get out of testing. And we're gonna give insights into, into test analytics with the modules that we now are now accessible uh, within the Sauce Labs application itself. And then Fernando's gonna give you some uh, behind the scenes secret sauce look at some of our, our deep numbers in the back end and how we relate those to the test analytics that we expose to you all through, through the product itself. Um, so to start this, it kind of goes without saying that you know, everybody needs better test data. In fact, we were just talking up front here about you know, what the boss wants versus what the developer wants versus what the, the, the manager of test is looking for. And so the developer is typically looking for how do I solve the problem at hand? I have a couple of tests that failed. How do I identify which ones failed and which are the most important ones to work on first? The manager is looking on how do I improve kind of quality overall? How do I know if this build is ready to release? Is my app working? Am I gonna make my deadline? And the manager wants kind of like the high level thing. Are my teams testing efficiently? How much am I paying this team versus this team when I know this team is testing less efficiently than this team? How do I take best practices and share best practices between teams? So everybody has kind of a different need in terms of data. And the concept here, and one of the things that will be a theme throughout this, is this zooming capability, right? How do you start from, very large, from the large data set, understand the overview of the situation, and then zoom down into those details so you have something actionable that you as a, an individual can work on? So kind of how did we get here, right? So we know that we need, we have lots of data. There's been lots of testing going on. Uh, the number of releases we have have accelerated. And we, but we've lost visibility in this entire process. And it used to be you would buy a, uh, an integrated package and you develop your tests, execute your tests, manage your tests, and review that test data from within that one monolithic packaged app back when we kind of did waterfall testing or, or, or kind of even fast waterfall testing today. Because it was integrated, we had all access to all that data, and you had report generators, so it was very easy to not have to look at logs, but generate these reports that you can again look through and identify these trends for yourself. However, as we've moved from kind of waterfall, waterfall to agile to CI and CD, we've lost that breakage because developers have looked towards open source, they identify the packages that work best for them in their workflow, use those packages, and go about their business creating tests, managing tests, and executing tests, and reviewing the data. But there's no linkage between those anymore because they're now disparate packages. So the natural thing for everyone to do was to go out and develop their own analytics capability so that they could start making sense of all this tremendous amounts of data that, that's pouring into them. Right? And so rather than have people, individual companies, that's not their, their value add, develop these analytics packages, that's what's driven Sauce to develop very sophisticated analytics within our tool. So everybody has the same set of, or is looking at the same sets of data in the same way and can make these comparisons and understand when, when a app is ready to release and help identify those things that are most important to fix first, right? So you can optimize your time and be more efficient. Um, so bottlenecks. So this, this comes from the questions that get most frequently asked uh, by our customers of us, which is, you know, here are the things that I have to worry about in my pipeline. How do I test efficiency, efficiently? So how do I increase my test velocity? How do I know I'm using my parallelization effectively? If you're a Sauce Labs customer, which I assume all of you are, uh, you want to maximize that utilization of those concurrent sessions. How do I prioritize my efforts, right? What, issue, what issues do I address first? I've got a team of five, 10, 15, maybe hundreds of QA folks. How do I ensure that they're working on the most important bugs and the bugs that are real? How do I debug efficiently? Which tests are really flaky? There's flaky tests, then there's really flaky tests, legitimately flaky, that run very inconsistently over time. What tools do you have to identify those tests? And finally, like we start out, how do I compare my testing to others? So, this is again back to the execs a little bit. How do I compare testing across teams, either across geos or across, uh, across uh, or different organizations? But also, how do I share best practices? And how do I come up with maybe a metric that compares my testing and my organization to pretty much everybody else in the world that's kind of generic? So Fernando's done a, a fantastic job. He'll talk about that. Um, so the fundamentally, uh, the problem and why we're here is bug remediation takes too long. Charles talked a little bit today about our state of testing report that came out. And over the past three years that we have done that report, we found that the time that it takes to resolve bugs hasn't really changed. And so this is some of the data from the back end 
that supports that. And it shows that for 55% of our customers, the number one thing they do when they have a bug, as the Dave Hefner said, they use the Google method, they immediately rerun that test. And so in 55% of the time, uh, that test passes and they're, they're fine. The issue is on these other 45% of the tests, those are the ones that, that represent legitimate failures that don't get resolved because of something, something in the environment or something, something hicked up, hiccup when you run that test. And so those are the ones where you spend most of your time. And you get things that are worrisome here, like in the 12 to 24 hour period where there's a bump up to 7% uh, of those tests just not being resolved in a full day. So the whole point of test analytics and what we're gonna talk about now is the data we can give you that will help shift this, this bunch of, of uh, uh, data to the left that allows you to both identify bugs and then give you the tools to help fix those bugs uh, a little more quickly. So I'll turn that over to you, to you, Fernando. All right. Thanks. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to achieve maximum velocity and test efficiently and make the most use of the capacity you have with Sauce Labs. So the most important thing to keep in mind when you're wanting to make sure that you're testing efficiently is to keep your test short. This is a great way to enforce test hygiene and uh, make sure that your tests are atomic and are testing one very specific thing and not a bunch of things. That way, if something fails, you know exactly what went wrong. Also, this gives you the ability to make sure that you're not clogging up your build with a test that takes a really long time. And we'll get into that and why that's important, but basically your build can only be as quick as your longest test. So not just like having a nice, average test length or a lot of short tests, but make sure you have no long tests. And that's gonna help you a lot when it comes to leveraging parallelization. So the next thing is make sure you're running your jobs massively in parallel. So that's gonna make sure that you're going as fast as you possibly can, and that's your lever on speed with your build process. Um, and then ensuring that your organization has enough capacity. So with a lot of teams using Sauce Labs all at once, something that ends up happening occasionally is one team might just swamp Sauce Labs uh, server and use up all that capacity. And other teams that maybe have modest requirements for, for uh, parallelization or a smaller build end up getting affected. So we'll look at that too. So in our analytics UI, we have this uh, concept called build efficiency on the analytics trends page which shows you every one of your builds, how long it took to run, and then that efficiency column, which is really, really important to, to keep an eye on. So this concept is basically looking at your longest job and trying to assess whether your build is taking longer than your longest job or shorter. So ideally, your build, like the best you can do, is as fast as your longest job is. And if you're at 100%, that means if your longest job is five minutes and your build took four minutes or six minutes, then um, you're not running as parallel as you could have been. In other words, you know, you had that long jobs like running sequentially as opposed to in parallel. So you want to make sure that you're at 100%. Um, and we're going to illustrate that with this chart, which is from, uh, this is a chart I made from a real customer's build that had short tests mixed with long tests to illustrate that concept of build efficiency. So you see right away that they ramp up to their concurrency limit of 80 VMs. Their test runner starts shoving jobs in and they all start running. They hit 80 VMs pretty quickly. And then you see this tail where during the, the build, uh, concurrency utilization starts to drop. And this is because there's a bunch of long tests that are being run that no matter how much concurrency they have, they're gonna have to wait on those tests to run. Another thing that complicates things is your test runner, like ideally, it would be smart enough to know that it should run all your long tests first, but sometimes it's not configured that way. So you're gonna end up like, you know, doing a bunch of short tests, and then like once you're at minute 10 of your build, oh, now it's time to run the long one. And you know, if you have long tests, you have to think about those things. Whereas if all your tests are nice and short, it's just gonna go very naturally, and you know, every test is gonna go neatly into the pipeline and, and finish right away. So um, this next slide shows that same build with the assumption that let's say you had infinite concurrency, like there were no limits and you were running at peak. So this build has like 600 tests in it and you can see that like after about four minutes, almost all the jobs are done. 
but you end up waiting you know, six minutes for that last tiny tail of super long test to run. So you know, we still saved a lot of time here by increasing concurrency, but we're still getting hit with that longest test you know, being 10 minutes, and there's nothing you can do about that. So yeah, uh, going faster, you can definitely increase concurrency, but the effectiveness of that lever is going to be constrained by uh, how long your longest test is. So really important to keep tests short. Um, and the efficiency metric on that prior UI is capturing how bad these charts look, you know, without having to actually look at, at this data. Uh, you want to make sure you're at 100% efficiency. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, thinking about how much of your concurrency you're using and um, if your team, if different teams at your company are using soft size at the same time. So this is what happens, um, in a, actually this is again real anonymized data from a customer uh, who could probably use some help managing this. So we've got green team who is just sucking up all the capacity and uh, basically making the uh, concurrency limit, you're basically just hitting that concurrency limit constantly. And yellow, red, and blue team which have pretty modest needs in terms of concurrency um, are getting penalized. So the bottom chart shows the average time across everybody, regardless of which team they're on, a test spends waiting for capacity because somebody is just you know, using an outsized amount of, of concurrency. So um, this is an issue that can be solved using our uh, um, uh, concurrency limits that you can basically narrow down on a specific team or a user and say, okay, um, green team, we're not going to let you just completely um, use the fire hose. We're going to cap you at 40 so that the other teams, you know, have a chance to get their builds in. Because, you know, when you're hitting this limit like that and a job is waiting like 60 seconds or sometimes even two minutes to run, you've got a capacity problem. And, you know, by fixing this, those uh, smaller teams can go a lot faster. Um, so one way to look at this with our uh, analytics UI is to, again, go to the analytics trends page and we have a VM concurrency tab. So this shows you every day and it has a resolution up to an hour so you can see within the day as well um, what your peak concurrency usage is. So here's an example case where the customer has uh, 10 VMs um, and every single day they're hitting it. Like there's hardly ever a day when they don't hit that limit. So this is a really good signal that there's, they're leaving time on the table and you know, by increasing concurrency, uh, they can definitely, it seems like they're gonna be able to benefit and go a lot faster. So this, if you zoomed into that team level chart from before, is consistent with a customer that's experiencing this. Um, so it's great that they're leveraging the parallelism, but you wanna be like, you want a healthy buffer. You wanna make sure that you're not like, constantly hitting your ceiling because it means that you can go so much faster if you added more. Yeah, and just so people know this, the green chart and the first couple charts are kind of back-end data we have, and what gets exposed to you as a user is that concurrency uh, chart that's in the, uh, the product itself. Yeah. Um, so the next thing uh, that we can look at with the analytics UIs we have is um, trying to figure out the most high-priority issues. So what percent of tests are failing inconsistently? So this is flaky behavior. Um, and then which tests are failing over and over and over? And like no matter how many times they're rerun, they don't pass. These are like the higher priority cases that signal that it's a potential regression issue or like a serious legitimate thing. Um, and some visibility into on which platforms the test fails most often on. So uh, a lot of our customers do a lot of cross-browser testing and they want to see if their failure rates vary by the different platforms so they can figure out, you know, where do I need to focus my efforts. Uh, so this is a feature that's coming out in the next quarter uh, which gives you an overview over a window of time all the tests that are, um, uh, that are being run and that top panel there basically shows uh, the number of tests that are consistently failing. So these are tests that are something seriously wrong. They just continue to fail over and over and rerunning is not going to be the magic sauce that fixes it in those cases. And then it also shows you the ones that are inconsistently failing. So this we're going, going through and looking at the run history of all the tests 
and saying, okay, these are pass, 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 fail, pass, 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 fail, pass, pass, fail, and those are the flaky ones that are inconsistent. And you'll be able to you know, zoom in on those and figure out what's going on with those and prioritize figuring out how to make those less flaky. Um, so the other, uh, the next panel shows you your failure rate across all your tests run uh, and basically gives you an idea, okay, is my failure rate across my 5,000 tests that I ran in the last couple weeks, you know, 1%, 5%, 10%, and can kind of give you a, a nice high level overview of where you are at across all your teams or within a specific user's test being run. And then that last panel shows you that same analysis broken out by different platforms. So you can see right away where all your uh, failures are by the browsers that you run on and the different operating systems that you run on. So yeah, this feature, uh, this UI will be coming out within the next quarter. And then once you um, identify some tests that are flaky or seriously broken, uh, you can zoom in another level and look at the context of that test's run history. So here you've got uh, all the instances of that test being run through time. Uh, it gives you the overall failure rate and you can see visually um, what's happening with this test. So here's a classic flaky test. You see all these clusters of green runs intermixed with red runs. Um, and you can see really clearly that this test is like, it looks like 50-50, <laughs> you know. Um, and there's something seriously wrong here. Probably some kind of timing issue. Maybe you can, you know, figure out if you need to wait more or, you know, have a ro ro more robust retry logic or something like that. But you can, you know, really easily see the, the context of that test run history. Uh, and every one of those dots um, you can click on and go to our wonderful test details page, which is great. But now with extended debugging, uh, you can zoom down and basically recreate the state of that test in extreme detail. Uh, you can turn on extended debugging for a particularly tricky, nasty test that you want to figure out what's going on. And you can download the HAR file once it finishes running, load it up in your favorite HAR file viewer, and see exactly what happened in terms of the networking requests and what was going on in the, in the, uh, in the DOM at the time and really quickly see that, for example, oh, an element wasn't found. And you can go to that step and see that, oh, well, it wasn't found because some API that uh, was relied on to render that element had a 404 error. So this is like the highest level of resolution. So we came up with, uh, a, we're trying to develop a concept of how to evaluate different customers um, where they're at in terms of the quality of their QA environment and their testing system. And uh, you know, some of the things we talked about in this talk in terms of metrics are, so you want a nice short test length. Um, you want a low failure rate, because if your failure rate's really high, um, it, it tends to mean that, like I, it's doubtful that you'd have that many regressions. So you want like, uh, if your failure rate's zero and no test ever fails, then may maybe you don't have enough coverage. But you know you want to keep your failure rate you know relatively low, um, and then concurrent session usage. This is making sure your test runner is configured so that you max out the parallelism that you have, and then cross-platform -plat testing, which is another um, way of kind of measuring you know how broad your your coverage is and how many platforms you're testing on. So um, you can kind of use this scorecard to uh, figure out where you're at. And in the future, we're hoping to kind of bake this into the product so it's automatically, you know, gives you a report of where you're at. Um, so I ran this scoring system on our customer base. And this is kind of how things fall out in terms of, you know, top 10% um, have greater than eight points, um, top 25 greater than five, and the top half have greater than three. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of where you might be relative to our customer base. And I'm really excited about hopefully building this into the product and having that just be calculated automatically. Um, uh, but yeah, that kind of gives you a nice little heuristic to look at. So the next thing I want to talk about is the future of what we're trying to do with analytics in general. And this is really exciting because uh, we showed the whole pipeline of, you know, from the most zoomed out to the most zoomed in view of what's going on with the test. Um, but ideally, you don't have to, you don't want to have to zoom in all the way and look at HAR files. 
ideally what we want to do is surface all of that um, all of that information of what's happening at a low level to a higher level so that you can just see it in an aggregate basis. And with Soft Labs, we collect, like you run the same tests many, many times on Soft Labs. And those tests every time generate um, a lot of log data. So what we're wanting to do is basically build up a profile, a behavior profile for every one of your tests, and then be able to tell you um, in a context aware way uh, what a failure means. Not just like, oh, this test failed, but be able to tell you, okay, this test failed, uh, and it failed in uh, a way that has never happened before. Or this test failed, and this kind of failure has happened, you know, 5% uh, of the time. So you can quickly see, oh, that's the typical flake behavior. Um, and be able to distinguish the, the signal from the noise with these flaky tests. Um, and automatically look at the logs and surface up uh, root cause level analysis things like 404 errors in a network, network request or a specific element not being found or a failure happening at a specific line in the test. Um, so the idea is that we'll automatically analyze all those logs and uh, allow you to zoom in only on the test failures that are really significant and really important to look at and the ones that uh, can be autom automatically sorted into a nice bucket that you understand, like, oh, this is, uh, you know, something was wrong um, on this step. And that, that step is the QA server sometimes is under too much load and the test, you know, fails on that step every time. So without having to look in and see exactly what happened in the test details page or the logs or car files, we'll automatically, like, understand that and surface that label um, up to you without having to jump into the test. And the idea is that we'll integrate this into our CI plugins and our test details um, page in a really you know, obvious way so that you can see that all in one shot. Um, so in other words, basically a richer description of what the test failure is and what happened in the test failure. Um, so yeah, you will, ideally, um, you only zoom in and look at the specific details when you absolutely have to. So intelligent analytics is about making that absolutely have to as you know, small as possible. So that's what I've got. Cool, all right, so uh, kind of summarize this up and kind of package it up for you in, in one way. Uh, test analytics is really, for us, kind of all about recovering that visibility you lost. We went from those packaged apps off to these kind of open source disparate apps and started using those. So kind of the, the four things we, that I think we want to really hammer home are that you, know, you want to test efficiently by parallelizing your tests. We run across many, many customers that are doing automated testing but they're not testing in parallel or not doing it very efficiently. So we hope with the tools and test trends, you can do analysis and look carefully at your parallelization, understand what you're doing and try and make your tests probably more of equal length in order to be able to hit uh, that, that, that higher parallelization percentage that'll ultimately make you a lot more efficient. Use test overview to identify kind of the high priority issues uh, and know what to fix first. So that's the one that kind of points out for you. Does, does all the routine kind of robotic work of going through the logs, identifying what fails and surfacing those up in a nice, nice visual way where you can quickly identify what platform or what browser is failing most often. And you can make then use your insights to say, oh, well, I know this fails all the time anyway, so I'm not, I'm not gonna play on that one. But this other one is interesting to me, and I'll put my efforts into analyzing this particular, this particular platform. Um, identify flaky tests with test history and use extended debugging. Extended debugging is a command that is, has been released and you can use now. You can run it with all of your automated tests if you want to, and that's the, the beauty of it, because it works directly with uh, Chrome and Firefox. Uh, there is maybe a slight uh, throughput or, or velocity hit when you use that, but it does surface out all those HAR files and the JSON logs. You can go back and look at those timing diagrams and understand if a test is really flaky and if it's really due to network issues, you can identify that. The nice other thing about uh, test trends is that this is what your executives can use to look at testing efficiency across your group, your organization, and across all the, organ all the organizations and groups within, within, the, uh, within that company or across even different vendors if you are outsourcing some of your testing to different vendors and do it, do it vendor by vendor. So that has ended up being a, a very important dashboard for kind of the executive level. And then finally, uh, we think it's important to compare yourself uh, in terms of testing and bug resolution times using our, our index. And we hope to put that, 
internally in the product in the future. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, the HAR files, get a reader for extended debugging. Right now, you, need to re you can download the HAR files and read those separately. Next quarter, that will be integrated within the product as well. So when you run extended debugging, it will then automatically download that and you'll have one click to be able to read that. Um, we want to check out a couple other sessions. We had a, a keynote this morning on uh, analytics that, that I thought was very interesting. We've got two more. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, we've got Yaroslav Boritz, who's the, uh, our product manager uh, for uh, both analytics and extended debugging. He'll be talking about that along with uh, some custom commands and give you much more details on how to use extended debugging, how does it actually work. So that'll be a fantastic session to go to. Uh, William Harrison from Omnisourcing is going to be talking about shifting left using Sauce Analytics. So he has some customer stories, uh, primarily at more of an executive level, and talk about how they're using uh, analytics to compare uh, testing between organizations for, for larger companies and things. So I'd highly recommend you go see those. We will also be at the answer bar, and Yaroslav is at the answer bar as well, if you have specific kind of detailed questions, as well as our SEs are out there. So any kind of technical questions, feel free to go out there and, and ask those guys. So with that, I think we've got about eight minutes left for questions. It's really bad. Yeah. Well, it starts with a small company, so we write a few test cases. Everything works fine. We test like important functions. Uh, now the company grows. We have like so much functionality. Now the tests grow so much, and it's difficult to like maintain them up. And the amount of benefit they offer, they're like much less compared to like overhead, they actually like make any problems for company. Uh, what do you think we can use like analytics uh, to address these kind of problems at growing and large company? Um, yes, yeah, could you repeat the last part of your question? So you initially write uh, small, small tests, now they work fine. Okay. But yeah, I think what you have to basically understand that concept and be as close to it as you can possibly be, you know. So yeah, sometimes you're going to have really long, complicated flows through the app that, you know, there's nothing you can do to, to fix that, but there's really nothing you can do to fix that. Uh, you should just keep in mind, okay, we're going to do that long, complicated flow, you know, as, as quickly as we can and keep it as atomic as we possibly can. And just know that maybe your ceiling is different than the ceiling of you know, a company that has shorter flows. Um, but there's not much really you can do. I mean, if you've got a long, complicated flow, you've got to test that, right? Uh, I like your UI of the new reporting analytic thing. But uh, do you guys expose APIs to get those analytics out as well? So we do have a, a, a SAS uh, analytics UI. I can answer that question. Yeah. I lead the analytics team. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, later though. Like we'll have an analytics API specifically for that stuff, but that's later in the year. Yep. Yeah. Someone up here? Oh. I can just yeah. right. Well, they want to hear you on, on the tape as well. Uh, so you show how you can uh, define the cap per teams, so you can do more parallel testing. If you have the case uh, that uh, they were talking, you have a really long uh, test, can you set a cap for those long tests so you can run the rest at a different cap? Like, even though it's within the same thing, can you tag your test so they will run only on X number of virtual machines? instead of using all the machines, and that loan test will be classified separately? Uh, I think the way that you would have to do that now is to uh, create a user and set a limit on that user, um, knowing that you know, that user is going to hit that limit, but no one else will be affected. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any plans to enforce concurrency on like a specific build or a segment of tests. It's really at the user level and like at the team level. We're introducing some new features uh, with team management in the future. Um, uh, but I don't think it's going to be at that level of resolution yet, although it's an interesting idea. Yeah, the team management features allow you to segment uh, VMs by, by individual, by team, by group, and keep all their tests, have a firewall between all their tests. So say someone in one region and another, someone in another region can't see each other's tests. So there's a lot of security built in around that as well. But I don't think we're going to have limits on timeouts on VMs yet. That might be a future thing. 
I think team management will definitely yeah. allow you to enforce concurrency limits by team. Yeah. Um, so you could shoehorn your concept into that by just making a new yeah. team or user. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on calculating the trade-offs? Like, it seems like if you have more VMs, you're going to get more concurrency, you know, especially across teams or peaks and flows, but then it's going to cost the, the company more. Whereas if you're not getting, if you're overloading the system, you're going to slow down the developer and then there's a cost there. And do you have any thoughts on uh, finding that, that sort of break point between uh, enterprise cost of VMs versus software development or costs of waiting. Yeah, right sizing your Sauce Labs account size is is a very complicated uh, thing to do. I think what you really have to like, you need data around it, right? And right now, um, that maybe that level of um, uh, the level of the answer that you need right now might not be answerable through analytics, but you can definitely talk to like your CSM and say, hey, we're trying to figure out what the right size is for us. Uh, can you tell us, you know, if we add 10, 20, 30, 50 VMs, what will that do to our, to our build process, um, the way that our teams currently use it? And we can kind of, you know, in the back end, look at your usage and figure out um, like how big the, the lever is there and how much faster you can go for each incremental VM. Um, you really need to be able to answer the question, okay, this X amount of money, is it worth spending this much to reduce the build time by, you know, 20%, you know? And, you know, you, you, be, you need to be able to say, well, how much faster will the build be? And then you can evaluate, okay, does it, is it worth spending this much money to cut the build time by 30%? And um, that's really the, the question you need to be able to answer. Uh, and we can definitely help you, you know, do that if you're trying to make that decision. Thank you. We're all set then. Any other questions? Uh, one last plug. We do have a uh, video testimonial room just to the left of the uh, registration desk. So if you want to sit down, we do a short video of you and talk about your experiences with Sauce Labs. And somebody is going to win an Apple iWatch today, and someone's going to win an Apple iWatch tomorrow. And these aren't the cheap ones either. They're really good. So <laughs> please come on down. Thank right, you. Thanks, you guys.